there's a story that I think helps make sense of the torrent of crises we currently face, climate change, racism, growing concentrations of wealth. And so picture this village with a river running next to it. And one day there's this woman working in the field next to the river. And she hears a scream from the river. She runs down to see what's happening. You see there's a child struggling to stay afloat in the river. And so of course she wades in and brings that child to safety. But as she do, she's doing so, she hears another scream from the river. And so she, of course, goes in to bring that child to safety. But then there's another scream. And so she yells out to her fellow villagers to come down and help because there's just a seemingly endless stream of kids coming down the river. And so they form this human chain and they're just bringing these kids out of the river hour by hour. This goes on for much of the day. In the sixth hour, two of the villagers break away and begin running upstream. And the other villagers yell after them, how can you possibly leave and we have to be doing this vital work of bringing these kids to safety? And they say, yeah, yeah, we do, keep doing it. We're gonna go upstream and find out who's throwing these kids in the river in the first place. And so what do we find when we run upstream? I think we find a truth that we generally don't like to think about. One day we're all going to return to this earth that we're birthed from. We're going to die. That can feel heavy, a double shot of gravity. So this story leaves me with a question. Is it possible that social and environmental harms persist despite the powerful social movements that have arisen throughout history to counter them because we're not targeting the root drivers of injustice. We're not targeting the upstream causes. In my new book, Radical Mindfulness, Why Transforming Fear of Death is Politically Vital, I argue that absent cultural resources like stories, mind-body practices and rituals to help us integrate the fact of finitude, it's easy to feel small and powerless in the face of this mysterious world that writes death into the fine print of all our life contracts. Because we often see death as a defeat and an insult, we can concoct fantasies of supremacy that give us hits of the power and control that the natural world appears to deny us. These fantasies can aggregate into ugly and deadly social formations like white supremacy or male supremacy. They can also show up in less destructive but still damaging personal habits like thinking we always know best, basically being a self-centered asshole. None of this is rational, but death can be terrifying. And so it makes sense that we stop making sense in the face of impermanence. As I argue in the book, finding ways to collectively face and metabolize the reality of death, whether through meditation, ritual, psychedelics, or other mind-body practices is not only paramount for our personal well-being, it's politically vital. Realizing a more just and ecologically sane future will hinge, I think, on our capacity to combine outward movements for change with inward practices that teach us how to love a life that ends.